This podcast is proudly sponsored by the Catholic Order of Foresters, a Catholic fraternal benefit society dedicated to helping members achieve financial security through life insurance while supporting the Catholic community through fraternal outreach. You offered me watermelon bubbly water. Yeah, that stuff's terrible. And you took the grapefruit. I got the grapefruit right here. I can't do grapefruit because it's disgusting. You know, what was that poem or about uh, the nursery rhyme? Jack Fat could eat no sprat and his wife. Jack Sprat could eat no fat and his wife could eat no lean. Together oh. they... See, this is like this. Cheers right there. There. Oh, the one that I, I don't like, doing, you yes. like. And... He, he said he gave me two options. Grapefruit or watermelon. I said, well, grapefruit's disgusting. And he mm. said, good, because I think... <laughs> I don't even like just... grapefruit in real life. Hey, so what do you... um? What's what's your uh, what's your take on praise and worship music? <laughs> um, uh, it, wait, first off, is praise and worship music ancient or new? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is very new. <laughs> um, music, of course, is ancient. Mm. Um, but this is unfortunate because. I have to be so charitable here. I, I really want to be charitable. <laughs> I I just grew up in like the worst period of like so out of the out of the Jesus movement came a lot of like hippie Jesus songs. Mm. So I'm gonna start with a compliment. There is a there is a song that in in seminary our liturgy professor uh, put on for us and that put on a YouTube for us and it goes, Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is a friend of mine. <laughs> and they got the, they're, I mean, they're like, and we're watching them like, they're, they're joking, right? This is like Saturday Night Live skit. And he's like, no, they're, they're no, serious. It's real. I'm sorry, I just drank something. When you you got to be careful when I'm drinking. I need to be careful when I'm drinking and doing this. We got expensive equipment here. So the, the out of the Jesus movement came people who genuinely loved Jesus and were trying to write beautiful songs okay <laughs> so i get it <laughs> i i get it um and then the if you grew up in the 80s and uh loved beautiful amazing family that i had you did not have a lot of options for like amazing christian music my dad to his credit really loved john michael talbot who for a time probably was on some of the cheesier uh, Jesus music side, but has written some really beautiful stuff that's sort of sacred and and has a kind of a hippie spin on it. So, and then he he became Catholic. Yeah, he's a he's a brother now, a monk, still writing still writing music. Yeah, I got a my the the guy that I wrote Catholic Young Adults with is also a monk in that same order. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, the ties that bind. That's amazing. So having said that, and this was part of it, it's hard to have this conversation without talking about music in general, sort of post, post-blues, post rock and roll, and the influence that that has had. Because yeah. what, you, what we've ended up with really in the modern Christian music market, and, I, and I'm not saying this, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of music some of you listeners might like. Like whatever you want. I mean, as long as it's theologically sound, I don't really think it it matters if we're like, well, I don't like this guy, whatever. Okay. I, th- I think it's it's appropriateness for liturgy it could be a totally different. Yes, question. yes. <laughs> for liturgy, that's just we'll get there. But for me, the reality is it's become a part of the pop music machine, which is identical chord progressions in almost every song. Identical lyrics that seem to almost be hashed out by like an artificial intelligence, <laughs> um, because they just sound so familiar. And maybe about twenty, thirty songs really in rotation yeah. at any given time. Well, I got. A, I have a friend who used to, uh, before he, before he got married and settled down, played for a Christian rock band, and they traveled and everything, and uh, they had a yep, couple of records. Too. Yep. And I don't know if you can speak to this too, but his, his their producer said like your songs need to say Jesus more in them than you yes, are. Yes, Because they are. were trying to be, like, more subtle and, like, write Christian-themed music without being overt, and the producer's like, no, you actually have to be overt. 
Yeah, so there's uh, there's like quotas that have to be met. Um, and in fact, most people don't know this, but a lot of your favorite uh, uh, Christian artists do not... I think the word artist should not be used for them because somebody else is writing their songs, mm-hmm. even for a lot of bands, okay? Yeah, they're so, performers. Yeah, performer is the word. But an artist... That word, we need to be really careful, I think, how we use that word. And, and it's similar to worship. You and I have had that conversation. I was really encouraged by what you said, that the word worship ought to be reserved for something very specific. So, you know, here at St. Max, when we talk about music, we, we say praise music, and I think that's appropriate. Right. I, I'm, I'm a stickler with the word artist as well. So for me, um, there are two artists that I really respect and neither are Catholic. Uh, John Mark McMillan <clears throat> is one of those guys. And he's actually, sadly, he's a really good example of what the industry does with artists. So he wrote this beautiful song called How He Loves. Uh, you, you probably heard it. He loves us, oh, how he oh, yeah, loves yeah, yeah. us. Beautiful, beautiful song. But he wrote that song after his best friend died mm. in, a, in a car accident. And there's actually a verse that no one knows about, about his friend. Mm. Because what the Christian industry did is they took that song from him, they paid him, and then every Christian artist under the sun recorded their own big, epic Christian version of that song, mm. from David Crowder to Phillips, Craig, and Dean, and uh, a whole number of other people, just Jared Anderson, on and on and on it went. Actually, Jared Anderson has had some pretty good stuff. But that, that song was a catalyst for John Mark's career. It, it gave him the money, the tools to go out and make the music that he wanted to make. But it was also this really sad sign of the Christian music industry when an artist really does write a beautiful song. Right. It just gets covered like a thousand times because it's, it's a machine. It's a factory. It's just bubblegum and Skittles is kind of how I see most of it. But John Mark has broken that mold, and I think he writes beautiful songs. And then Leland Mooring... He's been a staple really since probably the early 2000s. Like he was 17 when his first record came out. He just had this unbelievable voice. Mm. He's writing his, all his own songs and still to this day just writes what, in my opinion, are really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful songs uh, uh, to Jesus. And he also does some side projects with his siblings. So out of all that, you know, the Christian music industry has to offer today, there's really about two that I listen to. Audrey Assad was on that list. Um, she's, in my opinion, really struggling right now in her faith. And so I'm careful when I, like, you know, share music because you never know, obviously, and uh, theologically where an artist can go. And you're seeing a lot of, of Christian artists drop off the map. Mm. Was Kevin from DC Talk just came out as an ex-evangelical. Mm, yeah. So I like the Jesus stuff, but I don't like any of the Christian stuff. Mm. Um, and I want to be, uh, you know, super liberal on all these things now that the, the purity culture told me not to be or whatever the ex-evangelical culture is. It's a whole other conversation. So out of all of that, I, I'm trying to find the good. But th- the reality is when I started writing music at 15, I was terrified that somebody would tell me I sounded like somebody else. And I was really scared to write. Well, see, I mean, that's, you know, like that's, that's been my fundamental problem. It's like I don't know what channel... KTIS or whatever Christian channel you are in whatever city you're in, but I, I always know when I get there. Yeah. And you know, it's like I can I can hear I can hear yes. four beats of a song. It's like, oh, this oh, that's is a Christian, Christian song. Station. It's like that shouldn't it shouldn't it's not a genre. Christian music alone. shouldn't be a genre. Um you know, yeah. That, so that's that's been my frustrating. It all sounds the same. It, it's it. That's the factory. You are hitting it. I I've made the same joke in the car. Like, wait, just wait. I'm just gonna hit scan, and I will tell you when we've got to the Christian radio station. I don't have to hear any lyrics. Right. Yeah. Any any vocals. No. If I had my guitar right now, I, this is really uncharitable, but I could sit with my guitar on the spot and just write a hit Christian song. <laughs> <laughs> four chords and just a couple of phrases. And so in, in that sense, that that bothers me because we talked about beauty a lot on this podcast. Yeah. Something so beautiful has been degraded to something that's just sort of machine manufactured. Yeah. And I don't understand at what point that happened. I do recognize to an extent that, you know, it's almost entirely Protestant. I think Matt Marr is like the only out and out Catholic that's been allowed kind of in that. Right, in that world, and so yes, I, I met him one time. Oh, I was, did you? Uh, I was at Christmas Eve Mass in Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, where my aunt and uncle go, 
and uh, I turn around for the son of peace, and there's Matt. Oh, Marr. isn't that his <laughs> parish? Uh, yeah, I think he's I, down in Arizona. I guess so. And it was it was the uh, it wasn't the midnight mass. We went to the midnight mass also, but it wasn't the midnight mass. Is before I was a priest, and turn around and yep, yeah, there he wow. is. Wow, hey, peace, Matt. Yeah, I don't think so. I think he's Catholic. I think his wife is still evangelical. Oh well, she was there. And he's written some good the songs. baby's Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you know? Um, so outside of that, you know, I think Protestantism, the music almost tends to be their, the source and summit of their mass. It's either the, the sermon, I think you could argue, or it's, the, it's music. Well, yeah. You know, so this is, this is interesting. So um, Dallas Jenkins, the creator, the director of The Chosen, which is great, and I think a lot of artistry there, um, Totally evangelical. He was at some something, and there was a lot of um, uh, worship leaders. I'm putting scare quotes here. The, the worship <laughs> leaders um, is what they're typically called. You know, so that the you know the people who lead the music and bands and stuff. And he goes, he goes. Some yeah, they're recognizing him, and he says, "I'm doing, I'm doing all this so that people, so that you can really." bring the people to the next level. Like, like I want them to get into the gospel so that they go to church where they learn how to, where like they actually worship, which is what you do. Hmm. You know, that was his, his point. It's like, that's what, that's what, that's what the goal is. Like read the gospels and then actually worship, which singing, singing songs and stuff like that, which, is, which isn't bad. This, this, is, this right. is good. The Lord loves it when we sing to him. With yes, pure yes, heart. he does. Amen. Yeah. But, but you're, I think you're, you're right. The sermon and, and the song. And I would go even further. It's it's very much a sacrament in Protestantism. It's it's the it's the way we can kind of sort of touch. Mm-hmm. And I I, I I was really struck by this last week. I was listening to some of these songs. It's so funny we're talking about this today. And I realized there's all these lyrics about falling into his arms, mm. or or him in some way making contact with us. And my question was, okay, how? How in the real world is it like a suddenly I feel like a warmth in my body as if he's hugging me? I'm not I'm not saying this to be sarcastic or to make fun. It's a genuine question that has really baffled me because we're talking about it in a sacramental way. And what a Catholic would understand is a sacrament is some way of his him physically connecting with my senses in the real world. And music is the only way in in, in certainly the tradition I grew up in. Um, that we got that connection. We tried to picture him, you know, and it could get mm. so emotional that you would cry. You felt so close. Right. It's beautiful. It's beautiful that music can do that to us. I'm thankful for it. But I see it very much as sacramental in, in, in that way. My theory is that is part of what has sort of um, polluted the, the artistry and the beauty is just a kind of an empty theology on it because really you can't find it. In the Bible, you can't find. There's no worship leader in the New Testament, right? And, and this is this is the difficulty. If if my faith, uh, or the only way I know I've worshipped, is if I have some sort of emotional contact, you know. And, and I and I I don't doubt religious experiences, um, and I've had I've had some myself, and I've I've had good experiences with praise music. I'm not yeah, an anti yeah. at all. Um, but if if it's based on that. I mean, I know I know so many people who who've fallen away, and they've had they've had profound experiences with with intense praise, yeah, um, and they've they've fallen away. Yeah, and and I can I can speak from experience because I've had countless I mean, countless beautiful experiences singing before I became Catholic with people. I always preferred doing it with people. I never ever was like, man, I just want to like sing right now. I'm just going to go into my room and grab my guitar and just sing to Jesus. I'm not like that. If I was doing it, it was to write. Hmm. Um, but it was never like, I'm just going to, I just want to sing right now. I wanted to be with God's people. But I always found it interesting, as we talk about source and summit of worship, I I always wanted, I wish people would turn around, like when I was leading worship. I was a worship leader for a long time. And I will say, I'm thankful for all the times I got to just sing with people that were really trying to worship and love God and songs that I loved. It was a great privilege. But it, it bothered me that I was that they were looking at me because I was just like, everyone should close their eyes, know the lyrics, so you don't have to look at the screen behind me yeah, yeah, because yeah. you're just looking at me. 
um, so you can close your eyes. But even better, I would always throw this out to people. I wish you would all turn around and the band would be in the back. And then you could all just like look at a picture of Jesus. You know, and so, so like that's actually exactly what we would do when I was on Net Ministry. So Net is a ministry based here, here in West St. Paul in Twin Cities and it's very charismatic, you know. So every day on our team, 10, 12 of us, uh, traveling around the country in a van, doing retreats for young people at high schools, middle schools, youth groups, etc. Every day we would have a time of team prayer, which would consist of, you know, 30, 45 minutes of of praise. Wow. And um, yeah, and we would always we'd go into like if if we're able to go into the chapel, uh, we'd go into the chapel. We'd focus on the on the tabernacle or the crucifix. Uh, but oftentimes we were just in the the. Youth room, the you know uh, a living room, uh, and we just like find find the the icon or the picture of the crucifix and just like that's that's our focus. In fact, one time we were at a house. This is in Las Vegas diocese, and uh, the family didn't have a. There's no crucifix in the living room, and that was the only room big enough for all of us. And so I grabbed the crucifix from the hallway, and I placed it in the living room above the TV, and uh, and so we did we did praise. And that was our focus, but then I forgot to put it back, and the uh, the host home, the host family, <laughs> called the net center to complain and say, <laughs> the 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 net team was so judgmental. They thought that we weren't Catholic enough, so they redecorated our house. I'm like, no, I just totally forgot. <laughs> But, but yeah, we would oh we're like we're not going to stand in a circle. This isn't this isn't a, a self therapy session. Yeah. This is we're we're generating our our, our focus is elsewhere. Yeah, it's not a closed circle. Yeah, it's, we're going somewhere. And you you know, many people I think in, in Protestant tradition that I came from would say we were doing the same thing, but it was it was always invisible. Hmm. There was no there was no making visible something that was invisible. That was not known to us. So if I could imagine him in my mind, it was almost a Eucharistic kind of experience. And and so that's, I think, a large reason why there is such a big, in the Protestant world, emphasis on music, is it really is a genuine attempt at closeness, at nearness, right. um, that borders very much on, on sacramental. I didn't know what that word meant. If someone had asked me, but I definitely knew, like, yes, I'm trying to, like, get really close to him, you know. I'm trying to get super close. If I could be on a mountaintop, you know. And But we'd, we'd sing a lot of these songs. Um, you talked about this, you know, lyrically. There's all kinds of songs we'd sing about. I'd, I'd run for a thousand years, you know, if I could get a little closer to you. There was this great desire to touch and and feel. And when I, when I went to my first Mass and... I've, I've probably told this story, but the music was behind me. Mm, right. The cantor was way up in the balcony, and I'm looking straight ahead at Jesus in the tabernacle, and all of a sudden it connected like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is what I've been saying and wanting for like years and years. And sure enough, I show up at a Catholic Mass, and you know, it was just a cantor singing a cappella, but I couldn't see him. And I'm just looking at Jesus. And it was so beautiful. And here at St. Max on um, first and third Tuesdays, we do a little praise during adoration. And I sit up in the balcony, and nobody can see me unless they turn around and look at me. And I can see them right away if they're looking at me, not at Jesus. <laughs> and I get to sit and face and sing to Jesus, and we all just get to be in there and sit. And it's a beautiful, a beautiful way to do it. But outside of that, I, it's, it's also disappointing to me to see that um, Catholic artists... They're just either on the fringes or unknown or are dying out. Um, I don't know which is which. And a lot of the stuff I see, you know, maybe if I'm just perusing Instagram or whatever, it looks very Protestant in terms of the songs that they're singing or definitely, mm. you know, uh, Hillsong or whatever the big kind of group is putting songs out. And it all just kind of looks and feels and sounds um, the same. So I have my own issues with that. It, it's, it's, not, it's not a matter of sin, or anything like that. So I usually keep those things to myself. But I've just known, like, there is a time and place for people on stage singing music, for sure. Like, there could be great, there's great ways to, of outreach. When I was doing prison work, you got to have a guy on a stage singing and mm -hmm. preaching. I get that. But when it comes to praise music, it just seems like a lot of Catholic young people today that really want to do it, that have a desire for it, are stuck just having to copy 
the thousandth copy of a, of a Protestant song or style as opposed to breaking out and what would we write, you know? Let's just write our own thing and do our own thing. Uh, uh, that's always been my message to artists is just don't copy, don't emulate. If God gave you the ability to create something, then create, innovate, don't emulate. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think it's good. I mean, I, I can think of well, there's I, because I think part of it, if like if you're writing this, like I'm writing this so that it can be sung at a praise and worship night or you know something like this, then then the way you're writing it is is completely different. And I'm like th- those songs are can be really good, but yeah. there's a band called I don't know if they're still around. Um, 10th Avenue North. Do you oh, remember yeah. them? Yeah. They had uh, one song I used to kind of like. I can't yeah, remember what it was. There's, there's this one song that I heard on the radio a couple of times, and it just like shook me. I was like, whoa. Um, because it wasn't like anything I'd, I'd heard in that genre before. And if I recall, the lyrics were something like, um, if you're half the God you say you are, then come and heal my broken heart. Hmm. And I was like, whoa. Ouch! Like, ouch! It's like I, f- I can feel, yeah. I can feel like what he was feeling when he wrote that. Yeah. And it's not, uh, hey, I'm praising you, Lord, and everything. Grace falls great. like rain, and all or of even, that. you know, even like, blessed be His name. Yeah. You know, it's like in the good times and in the bad. Yeah, blessed is His name. It's like, well, you're, you're doing scripture, and we got Job here, and you know, yeah. um, it's like, no, this is just, this is just a man's guttural cry for help in a time of despair. Kind of like the Psalms. Ta- kind of like the Psalms. <laughs> and, uh, but it's not something you can pr- play, pray at a praise night, you know, yeah. it's like, because it's, you just can't do it. Yep. Um, but man, that was, a good, that was a good song. Yeah, we, we used to have, it's funny you bring that up, because we used to have those conversations a lot, introducing new songs to, you know, our, our congregation, and I... <laughs> There were a lot of songs. I'm like, I don't know. This song makes me cry. Well, the lyrics don't make any sense. Yes, they do. I remember I wrote. I, there was this great story I had heard um, about these Coptic Christians. There was a, a terrorist attack in Egypt, and um, people were killed in this car. And the car was still on fire and covered in ashes, and their bodies inside. And all these Coptic Christians gathered around the car. And just sort of chanted, we give our lives and our blood through the cross. Mm. Not for, but through. Mm. And I love that phrase, probably loosely translated, but it was beautiful. Like, it's through because of the cross that we actually have something in our life that we can die for. Yeah. Something worth dying for. And so I remember I put it, I I wrote this song um, called The Sound of Eternity, and it, the the bridge is just that refrain. We give our lives and our blood through the cross. And I remember somebody g- genuinely asking, "That doesn't make any sense. It should be for the cross." I said, "No, I can I can explain." And this is what it is. And and ideally, I I don't want a song to be so overt that you're like, oh, "Okay, I clearly know what that means." You want we talked about this with the liturgy. There should be some enough mystery that somebody would explore. Right, right. Right? Or at least ask. Like, I'm curious, what did what did this part mean? Yeah. Uh, at the same time, you know, you can obviously use that too much. I always saw music that I was writing as like a I want to be a pick and a shovel and an arrow. Just dig here and you'll find what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it to me, like pain is the, the great equalizer. And so that's a theme you'll hear in most Protestant music is like, God, I'm hurting, and God, where are you? And I just want to fall into your arms. And so you'll hear that as sort of a common theme. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I write a lot about pain, and I think that's a great place to be. But boy, it just seems like we've kind of peaked with with praise music today. And I, I don't know, my concern is I don't know what happens on the other side of that. Mm. Yeah. Like that's what I'm interested in no, in terms of this conversation. I mean, I think that's where do you go? Yeah, that's. I think that's an interesting. It, we've. I, I think in a certain sense, it was um, like a lot of it today is to, to to try to like tap into the emotivism that you know the the world that we live in more than more than any other time. You know, like we have to be emoting. You know, I mean, yeah. this is what this is what Facebook and Instagram exist for. So like I can emote all over you. Right. You know, uh, I gotta, I gotta tell you what I'm feeling right now. And I need to, I need to be feeling something. And interesting. Um, 
I mean, I really think that's part of it. And, and those aren't bad. Emotions aren't, aren't bad. But if, if they leave, then, then where do we go? I remember this talk um, on one of the Lighthouse Media CDs, and there was this guy who was in prison, had a conversion, and started this catechetical program um, in, in prison. And it was, it was very, he said, it, he said it was very just truth-oriented. We read through the catechism, and that was it. Huh. And, and they would read through the catechism, and people would have conversions. <clears throat> wow. Just very, very non-emotional, truth-based conversions. Well, you may be like, okay, so, you know, okay. But the evangelicals, they were, they were in conversions too, but they were based on like a praise experience yeah. or a prayer experience. We're going to pray over you and call on the Holy Spirit, and, and um, you're going to feel it. Well, he said that you know, the, the men who went through his program, the recidivism rate, the rate of returning back to prison, was, was super low, like 1%, wow. 3%, wow. Is super low. Huh. Compared to in that state, the, the average was 80%. 80% yeah. would return. He said the, for the evangelicals, it was like 50%. Yeah. He was, and his, his theory was... Well, you have this emotional experience, you convert, and then you go out and you try to find that again. Yeah. And if you can't find it, you say, well, whatever. Yeah. But if you had a truth-based conversion, then you, you go out and you say, well, it doesn't matter what I feel, the truth is still the truth. <laughs> Correct. Where faith and reason connect, art art and, and music, I think returning to that, that connection of faith and reason really needs to be a critical part of like what is true. And this is, maybe you could call it um, sort of creedal style music. These are the things that we know. We say the same creed at every mass because this is what we know and this is what we claim to be true. But I, I did prison ministry for years. Uh, all, you know, uh, uh, Protestants that I worked with exclusively all loved Jesus, all had a desire to see these people's lives changed, all authentic across the board. Um, but I was always very concerned that, you're just kind of amping up a lot of young men and women who only know really damaged emotions, who have only been emulating and copying and mimetically um, sort of developed by what they've seen in, in other people. And usually it's the gang community they were brought up around. Mm -hmm, and yeah. they only know how to sort of mimetically generate um, faith and action and words by copying the preacher that has been coming in. Oh, that's um, good. Did you say, that program. Did you just say mimetically? Mimetically. I mean, I think it's probably the first time uh, we've used that on our podcast. I think so. Maybe the first time any podcast has ever used that. <laughs> well, probably not. Uh, uh, Luke Burgess wrote this great book called Wanting, uh, The Power of Mimetic Desire, and Rene Girard. <laughs> yeah. Rene Girard is the guy that sort of, I think, founded this, this theology. But I... It's so dense in the world I came from. Yeah, yeah. It's so dense. And especially in, in the prison population, you just see that just trying to be somebody else. And, and when you combine that with the gospel, but not a fullness of the truth, when it's a heart conversion and not a heart and head conversion, um, you end up incomplete. Yeah. And when it's incomplete, eventually it runs out. And, and I think this is, this is kind of the, the danger. I'm not saying it's like we shouldn't do it at all, but there's there's a danger in trying to meet the youth culture in this uh, mimetic music, you yes. know, this emotional based music. Like, hey, hey, oh, you think church is boring? Here, we'll spice it up with with rocky jazz, you know, Correct. music that it hits your emotions. It's almost manipulative. Yes, and I've and again, I've I've. I've grown up with this. I've I've experienced it with. I've been working with Net for 15 years. I've uh, I grew up in a parish that was uh, praise praise music was wow. what we did, and and it's it's not the I, I don't I don't think that it's the the avenue in. I think it can be an outflow yes. of a converted person. Yes. So you go to a mass at my home parish or at Net Ministries and you have you have hundreds of converted people praising the Lord. Yeah. It's a really powerful yeah, experience. It's amazing. But you can't just take that and say, ooh, hey, let's just take that. So um, one of the things that uh, you'll see sometimes is these youth masses and you'll impose praise music onto a unformed, un, um, 
uncatechized group of youth. And you might see them do some hand motions and joke around with their friends and stuff, but it's not the thing that really converts them. Correct. It's certainly not the thing that keeps them. And I, I wonder if you've experienced that. In oh, your... I, I would go even further. It, I've known that for so long it's baffled me that people keep returning hmm. to an empty idea. Hmm. It's, I mean, it's the definition of insanity. It has never worked. It has never worked to get them, and it has never worked to keep them. Well, this is ironic, right? Because in in the Catholic world, this is often what's said, oh, we need to be more like the evangelical church down the road because they have all the, they have all the youth because they have the, the praise band, the, the, you know, the rock band and all that. Yeah. It's not... My theory is, and I'm again, I'm going to be really charitable here, my theory is that that's not the case. I understand that a big light and sound show has a draw in today's society, but we assume that that draw in poll is a good thing. Right. We've started that people going to rock shows and being entertained is inherently good. I would argue that it is not, that there's nothing wrong with being entertained and going and seeing that. Con- I think in general, going to see pagan rock bands is a waste of time. Okay, <laughs> just being honest. I have never ever been in my life to maybe all but one show where I was like, I was actually, I'm really glad I got to see that and experience that. So we started with a false premise, which was you need um, to gussy all of this stuff up in order to get people's attention. Now, that could be true maybe for an outreach if I'm trying to go out and specifically to draw pagans right? And bring music to their... I did that for years in, in prisons. It wasn't praise. It was never praise music. They don't know these songs. They don't know my Jesus, nor do they probably want to know him right now. I'm not going right. to come in and sing praise songs. We're going to talk right. about that, their life. Is that the best you got to offer? <laughs> right? Some We're just going to skip feelings. over the pain, right? So we started with this weird false premise that that somehow was going to be the solution. And year after year, decade after decade, more and more young people keep leaving the church and we keep leading, leaning into or had kept leaning into the very thing we thought would fix it, which had not been fixing it for decade upon decade. You're, you're talking about your, your old evangelical yes. yeah. church. So you saw that. I saw that everywhere in most kind of major mainstream Protestant denominations. You'll just see this continual belief that amping things up and giving this amazing music is, is what's going to bring the kids back, and it never works. And that makes sense, right? It will, an emotion is by its, its you know, we call them the passions. They're necessarily passing. <laughs> you know, huh. they're, they're very, they're very temporary. Uh, you know, depending on your temperament, you, you f- feel them stronger or, or longer or whatever, but they, they come and they go. And so this would make sense. Like, Hey, we're going to put on a show for you. I'd love to see the stats for something like Eagle Brook and the Twin Cities or seven, eight campuses and right. the rock concert and the rousing, um, sermon. Um, you know, how what's what's the what's the how long does somebody stay there? Yeah, because I would suspect that it's pretty quick. Like, oh yeah, we go for a while and then and then we stop going. Yep. You know, it's probably more likely that it's you know your your way out. You leave, yeah. you leave the Catholic Church, you go to Eagle Brook, and then you say, well, well I'll just I'll just stop going yeah. anywhere at all. And 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 that that makes sense. Like you might have a, a a youth group that's you know very rousing and you know seems really active and and lively, but it it fizzles really quickly. Yeah. What we, what we need is the the long slow road of discipleship. Yes. And it's not flashy. It's not emotional. It's not glamorous. Holy living is very hard. It's not quick. <laughs> it's it's slow. Yeah. You know. Music. I, I've never. I never really see music as a way to um, deepen roots, uh, like right off the bat. Like you're not going to find like, well, if someone's, if the seed has fallen into rocky soil, you don't dump a bunch of music on it and that's what changes the mm-hmm. soil. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, there are ways to get a heart of stone, to soften that heart of stone, and certainly sometimes it a musical experience could potentially awaken that. It's just unsustainable. Unless, as you said, he got a room full of people that just love Jesus. I could love him in silence. I could love him in music or what have you that can sing from an outpouring of something that's already that's already there. And that's what I'm interested in like pursuing. And so like, okay, so I've had, I've had some ideas. 
I, I, I try to do the um, – read the Office of the Readings every day, or the breviary. There's like a number of different names for it. But I've got like the old pre-Vatican II ones, beautiful. Ooh. And there's all these old hymns in there. Great. Boy, it's like great. We don't talk like that anymore or use these kind of fancy words. I thought, okay, well, I could just take these and put more, um, can I say, contemporary musical stylings to them. Um, that's one thing I'm trying to do. I also came across the uh, the Breastplate of St. Patrick prayer. Mm. It's just like, oh my gosh. Well, there's a number of versions. The one I found is just like breathtaking, tempestuous shocks and round the old eternal rocks and the deep salt sea. And oh my gosh, it's just like, <laughs> yeah. it's too long. But what was what hit me was I realized, oh my gosh, in 2009 or eight, I found a tiny piece of that prayer and I wrote a song. I wrote a melody to it, music. And I knew it was St. Patrick. I didn't care that it was St. Patrick or that he was Catholic or what I knew to be Catholic. He was a pre-Reformation saint, didn't he? Oh, yes. <laughs> right, right. That's, that's hilarious. Um, but it's beautiful. Christ beneath me, Christ beside me, Christ before me, right? Christ within me. Christ in the heart of every man, every eye that sees me, ear, ear that hears me. It's just beautiful. Like, oh, my gosh. So can we take some of these old prayers or even like a novena and put music to them? I'm interested in that. I've, I've told you this. I've, I've written like a whole s- sung version of the rosary. I think it would take about 40 minutes to do maybe 45. That's one worship set, right? I mean, it's the same, <laughs> it's the same song for 45 minutes. Um, but I'm interested in trying that. It's, and some of this stuff, you get so deep, you start to like, you get a really niche, you know, people that like, I want to sing the rosary for 50 minutes or whatever. I'm that guy. Well, and the, and this, this, you know, like this wasn't quite our, our topic, but like what music is appropriate to liturgy. We talked about this a little bit before, but you know, what, what you're talking about is devotional music yes. and, and devotions have always been kind of separate from liturgy the, you know, this is one of the reforms of Vatican II is like, Hey, Hey, we're not here to come and like say our favorite prayers silently and pray our rosaries and do these devotional prayers. We're actually here to pray the mass together. Right. And so uh, the music at mass can't be devotional mass. Like, well, this is my type of music and that's your type. It's like, no, actually there's a, type of music. These other types of music are, are great for other settings yeah. where I can get like, yeah, this is, this is my devotional and this is how I want to, to, to pray, free pray, you know, but different than uh, this corporate official prayer of the church. Um, it's but, an important yeah, distinction. Fascinating. Very important distinction and one that helped here as we close that helped me kind of explain my transition into the church was, no, we still sing. We just don't do it during the mass. It's a different way that we worship. It's a what I would call a higher form, but that sounds really snooty. I gotta yeah. find a better well, word. Well, and then form. we had a we had a kid convert to Catholicism a couple of years ago. He was in college, and he had, he's a music student, and stopped into the cathedral and heard the organ and the chant, and s- kind of started coming back and saying, Oof. "I want I want more of this." And then started listening to podcasts and listening to different audio books, and and then it's like, "All right." I mean, started with the music. Yeah, but it was oh. the, it was sacred. You know, the music of the ages, the music that the church has was grown out of the the very yeah. Fabric sacred music is probably a whole other podcast episode. And we ought to sometime just introduce people to like because there's some there's some movements happening. I found a couple people that are trying to re keep it alive, reintroduce sacred music. Young guys, mm-hmm. young gals. Yeah. One guy just goes around different gorgeous cathedrals and she just sings a cappella. Oh, nice. And they record it, and it's just breathtaking. So maybe we'll do that in a future podcast. But for now, let me just say, cl- close lovingly, like the music that you like. And, uh, you know, theological differences aside, I can't necessarily say is it theologically sound because who's the authority? Go listen to that episode. But I'm not knocking Protestant music. I'm not knocking Catholics who will only write Protestant-style music. I'm just trying to offer some better ideas. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) We'll see you guys next time. At Catholic Order of Foresters, we're committed to bringing Catholic values to life and financially protecting Catholic families right here in Minnesota. Our members enjoy benefits like scholarship eligibility and peace of mind knowing their family is secure, even if something happens to them. 
Each year, thousands join us to support people in need through our Feeding God's Children events, spirituality tap-ins, and mission trips. Wouldn't you love to be a part of an organization that embodies your Catholic values? Find out how you can be a part of Catholic Order of Foresters by calling General Agent Brian Markiton at 763-658-4009. That's Brian at 763-658-4009.